thanks a lot for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the effects uh, of uh, um, an epidemic, and in particular I'm going to be thinking about uh, uh, the current uh, epidemic of COVID-19. Um, my uh, question uh, is going to be, first of all, uh, a basic one. How should we think of uh, an epidemic uh, uh, in a macroeconomic model? Should we think that it is uh, primarily a shock that affects the aggregate supply of the economy, or should we think of uh, an epidemic as a shock that affects primarily the demand, the aggregate demand side of an economy? And the natural way of thinking about an epidemic I'm going to show is uh, starting as a supply shock because people are going to be locked down and they're going to stop going to work. And so some sectors that are primarily based on pers in-person contact are going to shut down. Uh, this means that production in, in those sectors is going to shut down. However, I'm going to show that uh, this shock that starts as a supply shock can propagate to the economy as a demand uh, type of shock. And, uh, and this can make the drop in the, um, in the output of the economy even bigger than the effect of, a supply of the initial supply shock. So this can make the recession worse. Not only, but also this means that uh, fiscal policy that stimulate demand uh, may be something uh, that is uh, um, desirable. I'm going to show that two are the main ingredients to obtain this propagation of a supply shock as an epidemic uh, into a demand shock. And uh, these two ingredients are first, uh, that we need a model with multi-sectors and where goods produced are complementary. So when one good is not produced anymore, consumers stop demanding goods that could be produced or reduce their demand for goods that could be produced, amplifying the original shock uh, to the sector that is uh, locked down. Second, uh, the other important ingredient is uh, incomplete markets. And, and this means that, sec that workers uh, in sectors that are shut down are going to lose their income and are not going to have an insurance that help them um, keep their spending up. So that this is going to feed back in lower spending and generate an amplification in the original shock. My talk is going to be based on work on the macroeconomic implications of COVID-19, uh, joined with Guido Lorenzoni, Ludwig Straub, and Van Werning. So Everybody is unfortunately aware of the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is having very fast and deep effects uh, on the macroeconomy. Um, as an example, in the United States in the last two weeks, uh, um, more than six million uh, of unemployment claims uh, uh, have appeared uh, per week, which is a, a scary number. And today, the IMF just released the um, uh, World Economic Outlook with predictions about growth for 2020. And unfortunately, the numbers are very scary. The uh, world growth rate is going to drop by 3%, be negative 3%. So uh, over, all, all over the world, governments and central banks have been uh, uh, very worried about the macroeconomic effect of the pandemic and have uh, claimed to uh, be willing to do whatever it takes to help the economies uh, um, to uh, not being hit too hard by this pandemic and to be able to recover fast after this is going to end. And these... Uh, um, generates a, a, a natural question that is, uh, uh, should we think that spend, then stimulate spending is something desirable when, once we have a shock like a, a COVID-19 pandemic? And so there is an active debate that if we should think about uh, an epidemic um, as a shock that is primarily about aggregate supply or as the primary aggregate demand shock. The natural way of thinking about uh, uh, COVID-19 is thinking that uh, this, is this is primarily a supply 
supply shock, or at least initially a supply shock, because the direct effect is going to be that people are going to stop going to work, uh, either because they're uh, uh, going to be sick and quarantined or in the hospital, or because of lockdown policy that have been implemented throughout all the countries. Um, this is going to um, naturally drop the production of uh, uh, goods and services in those sectors that are primarily affected by the lockdown. In uh, uh, our paper, we um, show that actually, even though the epidemic, an epidemic is initially a supply shock that affects some sectors that are primarily affected by the lockdown, this type of negative supply shocks can propagate to the rest of the economy as demand shocks by creating demand shortages. And uh, uh, we are going to name this type of supply shock that can uh, generate demand effects uh, that, are, uh, that generates a drop in uh, output that is even larger than the one generated by the initial supply shock, Keynesian supply shocks. I'm going to show that there are two main ingredients uh, that uh, help uh, um, Gen making a negative supply shock, a Keynesian supply shock, and these are first uh, uh, complementarity of goods across sectors, and second, incomplete markets. Moreover, I'm going to show that two additional ingredients are important uh, in amplifying uh, the demand effect uh, of these Keynesian supply shocks, uh, and uh, in particular, I'm thinking of input-output linkages across sectors, uh, in particular across sectors that are more affected by the uh, epidemics uh, and sectors that are not as much affected, and uh, the other ingredient is uh, introducing businesses, and in particular business exit, and show how um, uh, a supply shock, uh, like an epidemic, can generate a cascade of exits uh, that endogenously make uh, uh, the um, number of sectors affected uh, uh, very large. So uh, these uh, um, theoretical points uh, have some uh, uh, important implications in terms of uh, policy debate. Um, First of all, traditional policies like monetary policy easing and fiscal policy um, be, may be desirable because uh, if uh, a supply shock have a demand component and generate some demand shortages, then uh, this type of, of policy are desirable. Um, however, I'm, we are going to even uh, uh, a point to the fact that traditional fiscal policy may be uh, even less effective than uh, uh, in normal times, and social insurance uh, uh, is going to be an important component of policies that uh, address uh, COVID-19 or epidemic type of shocks. Also, another type, another ingredient that is important uh, uh, for uh, uh, policy. Um, that address these issues are a type of policies that incentivizing, incentivize preserving job matches. And this is more for a long run perspectives to avoid the disruption of matches that are productive and may have long lasting consequences for the recovery. So let me give you first a preview of what uh, I'm going to show you. First, uh, if we consider a macro model with a single sector, then COVID-19 can be simply and primarily represented purely as a negative supply shock. However, once we introduce uh, multiple sectors into the picture, then uh, a COVID-19 type of shock may actually be represented as a Keynesian supply shock. And uh, in this case, uh, this, this means that if you have a 50% drop in each sector, the uh, macroeconomic effects are gonna be different than in a situation where you have a 100% drop for half of the sectors of the economy. And there are two main forces that contribute to make a, a, an epidemic shock a Keynesian supply shock. First, complementarity across sectors, and second, incomplete markets. And I'm going to explain that next. So let's start from the one sector economy. Uh, our main result is that if uh, uh, in, in one sector economy and complete markets, uh, 
uh, a negative supply shock uh, um, is a pure, purely a supply type of shock. It's not Keynesian in the sense that it will generate a natural uh, uh, a rise in the natural interest rate. Or if you want to look at it at this differently, if you keep the if the uh, central bank keep the interest rate constant, this will generate an increase in excess demand. And why is that? Well, <clears throat> the intuition is simple. If you have a negative supply shock that is temporary, because we are going to be always thinking about COVID-19 as a temporary negative supply shock, well, then this is good news uh, for the future. So agents uh, want to borrow and not save. On top of that, this, that is a relatively um, standard result, we also show that in the paper that a one-sector model, even if we incorporate in complete markets, um, it does not change the result. So in a, an epidemic shock is still primarily a negative supply shock, okay, with inflationary pressure for the economy. Now, can multiple sectors change the result? And the answer is yes, if we introduce two main ingredients. First, let's think about complementarity between goods. So if we consider a sector with multi, a model with multiple sectors, we can think about an epidemic shock as a shock that has a direct effect of shutdown activity in some sectors that are more contact intensive. And here I remind restaurants, gyms, hotels, hair salons, and so forth. These, however, has implications also for the demand of goods that are produced in different sectors. And in particular, there are two different types of effects that can arise. First, if you think of sectors that produce goods that are mostly substitute for the goods that are not produced anymore, actually you could uh, see an increase in spending in those sectors. So, so when restaurants close, for example, there is gonna be an increase in spending in food prepared at home or takeout food. On the other hand, if you think about sectors that produce uh, goods that are mainly complements for the goods that are not produced anymore, we could see a, a drop in demand. And here, for example, you can think of when restaurants close, close people stop or reduce their shopping for fancy clothes. When gyms close, people don't buy any more sports clothing. When hotels close, people don't buy new luggages anymore. Uh, now, what, what is the net results? result? If complementarity forces are strong enough, huh? then the direct, uh, the effect of the lockdown is going to be an overall uh, drop in spending that can make the recession spread even more. Let me show you this uh, mechanism through a graphical representation. So for simplicity, consider only two sectors, sector one and sector two. Sector one produces a good production, does require a, a physical interaction, and sector two does not. Okay, so uh, if uh, um, there is a lockdown, if there is an epidemic, uh, sector one is going to be affected, but sector two is not going to be affected. And assume that sector one produces 100 and sector two produces 100. Now there is a workers in sector one and workers in sector two that gets income from, from these sectors and they spend both type of workers spend in both sectors. Okay? So the arrow upward are the spending of the workers in those sectors. This is before the shock. Now after the shock in a representative agent version of the model where workers are fully insured, well, now the shock can re be represented as a lockdown uh, uh, that affects sector one. So sector one is going to shut down. There is no more income produced in sector one. So 50 is not going to be produced anymore uh, goods in sector one. Um, but still, sector one workers have income because there is insurance. And both sector one workers and sector two workers are going to keep spending in sector two goods. Now, the question is how much? They're going to still demand 50, they're going to demand less, they're going to demand more. And this depends on which type of goods is produced in sector two. 
So if the goods producing sector two is uh, mainly a substitute for the goods produced in sector one, well, then it may be that the demand goes beyond 50, becomes bigger than 50, because now workers in part compensate the fact that they cannot buy any more goods produced in sector one by buying more goods produced in sector two. However, if the goods produced in sector two are mainly complement for goods produced in that used to be produced in sector one, well, then demand may drop below 50. Okay. And so the effect, the overall effect of the lockdown is going to be larger than the simple drop in uh, production in sector one. How to summarize these results? Well, uh, in uh, um, our proposition, we show that in a model with multiple sectors and complete markets, um, a negative supply shock can become occasion supply shock when the intertemporal elasticity of substitution is larger than the um, uh, elasticity of substitution across goods. Okay, so one of a row is the elasticity of substitution across goods, across sectors. And so if uh, the goods are uh, um, bad substitutes, so our complements, uh, one of the row is small, and we are in the P and we are more in the pink area, that is an area where the supply shocks become an occasion. If instead one of the row is large, and so the goods are mainly substitute, then we go in the area where these are uh, an epidemic is a standard supply shock. Now, how about the second ingredient? How about uh, if we introduce incomplete markets into the picture of a multi-sector model? Well, again, let's think about the direct effect of lockdown as the shutdown in some of activity in some sectors that are more contact intensive, restaurants, gyms, hotels, and so forth. And now, with incomplete markets, this effect of lockdown not only has effect in terms of spending decision, but there's also additional effect coming from the fact that workers that used to work in sectors that are affected by the lockdown are not perfectly insured. And so now they are going to cut back on spending in all sectors. Now, it's true that workers that work uh, in the sector that are not affected may increase spending. Yeah? Okay? Uh, but uh, the thing is that they have a lower marginal propensity to consume relatively to the workers uh, that are affected, uh, that uh, are in affected sectors. And so even though you have an increase in spending from those workers working in sector two, the drop in spending uh, generated by the workers in sector one is going to be larger. Here is uh, a graphically what happens. Uh, uh, so if you look at the third panel C, once we introduce incomplete markets, not only sector one now is shut down and doesn't produce any income for sector one workers, but there is no arrow starting from the red um, round circle where sector one workers stay because now sector one workers do not have any income to spend. So spending in sector two is only limited to sector two workers who are the ones with low marginal propensity to consume. So as a result, uh, in a model with multiple sectors and incomplete market, uh, a negative supply shock can become occasion type of shock, type of supply shock. And this is true in a larger parameter space than the one where it was true when markets were complete. As you can see from the picture, the blue shaded area is now bigger than the red shaded area that I have shown you before. This figure shows that if we uh, look at the um, degree of market incompleteness and mu in our model is the, the larger is mu, the larger is the market incompleteness, the more incomplete markets are. So as market becomes more incomplete, the larger you drop in output you have in response to an epidemic shock. Now, let me move on to fiscal policy. Um, what uh, uh, what does it say? What these results say about fiscal policy? 
where, first of all, they tell us that if shocks, if an epidemic shocks is a Keynesian shock, well, then fiscal policy is desirable because there is a lag, there is a shortage in demand, so some stimulus may be helpful. And this is true, especially if the zero lower bound is binding. However, it is interesting to notice that if government spend the government that if we have a, a, an epidemic type of shock, the government spending multiplier can actually be smaller than usual. And why is that? Well, because now we miss one of the standard feedback effect that comes from a Keynesian multiplier, meaning that when output goes down uh, and uh, uh, spending goes down. Uh, now, there is, uh, for those uh, workers that work in affected sector, there is no increase uh, in income because even though there is more demand, there is no more production in those sectors that are shut down. So these workers uh, are not going to have the benefit of this multiplying effect on the income. And these are the workers with the highest marginal propensity to consume. So in this case, clearly, uh, some form of fiscal insurance uh, would be more desirable. Let me now move on uh, to uh, an additional uh, ingredient uh, that may be important to think about the macroeconomic effect of an epidemic. And these are supply chains, so input output linkages across sectors. So far, we have talked about the importance of complementarities between sectors. But one way to increase the complementarity across sectors is to introduce input-output linkages. And in particular, if we think about uh, um, affected sectors that used to demand or to use intermediate good inputs and capital goods uh, that are produced in non-affected sectors, uh, now, once you have a shutdown, this demand is going to drop and this is going to generate uh, um, an even larger uh, um, endogenous demand shortage coming from the supply shock. So, for example, if restaurants use dishwasher and dishwashing machines and repair services, once restaurants close, the demand for dishwashing machine and for repair services is going to drop. So, the interesting thing is that People typically think about supply chains from the upstream to the downstream. So at the beginning, when the COVID-19 spread out in, in uh, Asia and in China in particular, uh, in the U.S., there was a lot of talk and scare about the fact that uh, uh, Chinese industry producing intermediate inputs used in the U.S. were closing, were shutting down, and these would have had bad consequences for the production in the U.S. This is true, but on top of that, there is also the other channel, and the other channel is what is important for the demand propagation. The other channel is that now, if instead sectors that are affected use, use to demand the intermediate inputs from other sectors that are not affected, these may have a demand uh, amplification effect that travels from downstream to upstream. Another important ingredient uh, that can amplify the demand uh, uh, effect of uh, Keynesian supply shocks uh, is uh, uh, the um, introduction of uh, business uh, exit. So if you have a, a lack of demand for some good, this may generate uh, a a drop uh, in uh, production in businesses and so can generate in particular the shutdown of, of businesses also in non-affected sectors if these are sectors produce goods that are complementary to the ones uh, uh, that are producing the shutdown sectors now if some business shut down there is going to be now a feedback effect because if this business shutdowns, there are going to be other sectors that produce goods that are complementary to those sectors that shut down where businesses may shut down again. And this is, can propagate and endogenously generate a, a shutdown in more sectors than the one that they're directly affected by the lockdown. Okay? And this is going to generate a large amplification effect. Um, finally, I want to uh, talk about uh, um, public health and macro policies. So obviously, um, 
an epidemic, uh, uh, not only as uh, bad macroeconomic consequences, but primarily as bad health consequences for the population. And so even uh, when policies are not introduced, even if there is no lockdown policy, private uh, uh, aid, private citizens may decide to reduce their consumption in sectors that require personal interaction uh, because they are afraid to get sick. And this is going to generate some involuntary unemployment. Now, first of all, uh, um, we are considering a model where the production and consumption uh, in sectors that require uh, personal interactions are going, to be, are going to be bad for the health of consumers and workers. And so then a government that design an optimal policy should take that externality into consideration. So once we do that, and we have this Pigouvian externality element in a model, well then unemployed the unemployment that is generated, some unemployment may actually not be socially inefficient because it may be necessary to improve the health conditions of the economy or to avoid the health um, degeneration in the conditions of the population. Um, a second uh, remark that I want to make is that once we, we need public health policy to help the uh, epidemic not to spread, well, then we also need macroeconomic policy because according to our model, there are going to be, as a consequence of public health uh, policy that are going to shut down sectors, there are going to be demand spillovers to other sectors, uh, um, according to our Keynesian supply shock uh, type of argument. And so then stimulus is going to be... Um, positive and necessary to help those uh, um, demand, uh, to stimulate demand in those sectors that are not shut down. Finally, uh, uh, with incomplete markets, uh, targeted transfers uh, seems to be uh, the most uh, desirable type of policy because these are going to be good for three reasons at the same time. First, they're going to provide insurance. Second, that they're going to rise the natural rate, which is important with, if we are close or at the zero lower bound. And third, they're going to make public health policies more desirable. Let me uh, end with uh, um, three remarks uh, uh, about Italy. Um, so naturally, uh, we... In Italy, the situation is uh, very tragic. We are at the peak of an health emergency. And when you are at the peak of an health emergency, virtually all sectors are shut down. So in a sense, our model is not uh, uh, relevant uh, for this moment of peak because all sectors are virtually shut down. So we cannot think about demand uh, uh, transmission effect to other sectors. So the only economic policy that is uh, reasonable in this situation is disaster relief. So just help uh, uh, households uh, to survive and to have enough uh, uh, money to, to uh, have, cover their primary needs. Now, our model is instead important uh, to think about what to do as you are uh, introducing, uh, starting introducing a uh, lockdown policy and for the near future when you start uh, uh, getting out from the total lockdown and you start opening uh, some sectors. Um, second, I want to uh, make a positive note, note in terms of which policy have been implemented in Italy in a sense that uh, there has been a wave of positive, a strong safety net that are clearly very helpful in uh, this type of epidemic shock like casa integrazione or paid leaves. And finally, I want to um, I want to make uh, I want to notice that uh, once uh, we consider uh, the international context, uh, it is uh, um, important uh, to consider the need for coordination among countries, and this is particularly true for Europe, where there is a lot of trade across uh, among among different countries. And you can think of our model, uh, if you want, with different sectors as a model with different countries. If you have a shut, complete shutdown in some uh, countries and not in others, these are going to have important consequences for the demand of goods and services produced in other countries. And so clearly, this uh, broad picture needs some uh, 
uh, optimal design and coordinated uh, policy efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you.